So, Sauda, uh, we've known each other since 2002, 2003. You were just out of Cinematography Institute in Uzbekistan. Uh, what attracted you to make a work about Central Asian Amazons? Well, curiously, from uh, any Central Asian you ask, uh, if they know Kakas, which means 40 girls, everyone would say yes. So it's a collective memory, it's a knowledge that is transmitted from generation to generation, and it's very alive. Everyone knows that there were 40 girls that protected their land, that, that they were defending their land uh, from the invaders that were coming uh, to Central Asia, basically, to the region that lays between the Amudarya and Sardarya. So, of course, it's so deep, and somehow I think that everything that is related to our childhood becomes more and more, gets more and more value as we, as we grow in, or as we walk in our life. And I think that that was one of the reasons. And, of course, the fascinating part of it, when I start researching, I start finding out architecture related to the 40 girls, fortresses of the 40 girls, and girls in the south of Uzbekistan, in, uh, in the west of Uzbekistan, uh, the holy place is called, named by 40 girls. So there is this enormous memory dedicated to the presence of these young warriors that protected their land. And uh, so it touched me deeply. And uh, since I was uh, uh, making uh, my previous project related to women in Central Asia, I thought, well, this is uh, another step for me to go on in this direction and to explore this world. You've been living basically outside of Central Asia for the last 15 years, uh, but you keep coming back to Central Asia as a source of inspiration for your artistic work. What, what pulls you back? Well, I guess, um, well, it's, <laughs> it's a very um, sensitive question somehow because I ask myself why didn't I integrate in Europe? Uh, doesn't it touch me? And I would say that if someone would ask me today, like, where would you go? Like, here is the opportunity, do something in your creative expression, I would definitely go back to Central Asia because I think that there is so many uh, stories to tell and share and uh, there is uh, all these cultures that cross the region. There is uh, uh, in different forms, you know, in legends, in, in literature, in music, in uh, beliefs and the in spiritual dimension that should be spoken out. And somehow I feel a, a responsibility to share it. And uh, I think that this is the reason I keep on working in the region, without the borders, you know, really like Central Asia. These the stories you're telling in Kirkus are ancient stories, ancient legends. Uh, uh, the instruments that you'll see on the stage are traditional instruments of Central Asia except for the percussion, which is, which is Western. And yet, it's not at all a period piece. You're not trying to recreate some historical accuracy. On the contrary, it's an extremely contemporary piece. So how do you explain this sort of seeming paradox of contemporary work about antiquity? Like, even if my, in my previous answer I said, uh, I go back to the region to work with the beliefs or a tradition, I always look for, an, uh, for the bridge with the present day how this relates to today, how it relates to me today, how it relates to other people around me. And I think that this what it, that, that makes it contemporary, you know, like if we can find a point where a, an ancient tradition or an ancient knowledge keeps on referring to the present day. And uh, so uh, I was not interested in making a historical film or historical spectacle of Kafkas. I was trying to find how it is still alive, the spirit of the story, or the emotion of the story, the meaning of the story, in present day uh, music, in present day uh, actress, in present day uh, physical presence of the, girl, the girls that you find there. Because, you know, I had these jokes when I was going to Karakal, Pakistan, where the epic story of Kirkus uh, originates, where they say, well, women here are too strong. That's what men say. They are too strong. They are too... There is a, a power that's uh, hard to control, you know, and it's still there, you know. You feel it in their vocals, you feel it in their music, this expression, the dynamics, um, independence, you know. Um, so uh, I thought, well, here we find the crossover of the past and uh, of the present, and uh, I think it's very important to put this project together, uh, also to give a, a strength on our side to these musicians, to these performers, that they should go on. 
with their music and I was say, saying to them always, you know, you have your tools in your hands, you don't have archery, you don't have uh, your horses, but you have your instruments. You have your voice, you have your vocal, you have your emotion, your physical presence on the stage, go on, you know, continue with that. The, 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 um, <coughs> excuse me. The, the production is, is certainly in part storytelling. You tell the story of the 40 girls through film and through music. Uh, and yet it's much more than that. How did you arrive at the particular visual language of, of the film, which, which has a lot of dreamlike, uh, almost surreal parts to it? Well, in, uh, when I read the epic story, uh, it's a very old, ep uh, long epic story. It's around 300 pages and it's full of different narrations. And uh, I said, well, what, what I can do with that? You know, what is accessible today to the public? How we can touch the public today? Basically, what I'm doing, I hope, uh, I hope that it's a cheat in the work, is retelling the story, but using the modern tools, which is image, which is sound, uh, the sound of traditional music, as well as <coughs> I worked with the composer Dmitry Yanofyanovsky, who is uh, a composer from Uzbekistan, who's a contemporary composer. And uh, basically, we're trying to create this language. Our challenge was, uh, what do we do with the traditional music in, in this case? How we try to make this music serve a concept, an idea, since uh, the repertoire is very various, um, and uh, it comes from different schools of music and vocals. And we had to create kind of a, a carpet where all these elements work together to create one message, that it serves one message. So it was a challenge, and uh, we were saying also like how we can create, um, uh, uh, how we can give an atmosphere, a different atmosphere to this music. So that's where Dmitri worked it out. Basically, the process was that uh, I wrote the script in the beginning, and then there was the casting, which took around uh, a year, going uh, many cities in Central Asia, talent uh, scouting the talents uh, of these young girls. And uh, when the cast was done, the repertoire was put together, related to the script. Uh, that's when I said, okay, Dmitri, now this is the point where the sound... Like, let's take it the other way around. There is a script for the music with the repertoire selected. And as soon as we find the language, the common language in the sound, then I go to make the film. So this is the reverse of the way most movies are made. Usually a filmmaker shoots the film, edits the film, gives it to a composer, the composer watches the film and composes the soundtrack. Basically, you did the opposite, yes? You said yes. to the composer, compose the music and then I'll shoot and edit the film according to your script. Well, what we did is that he composed the first 15 minutes, and then when I heard the first 15 minutes, after a long back and forth, I said, well, here I have a total confidence that we found that the, com the, the language in common, and I can go on. So basically, uh, there were first 15 minutes of music, and then I went and I filmed, then I edited. So it was really like going back and forth all the time with Dmitri. But of course, in this case, uh, we were thinking in the beginning, what is the leading point? Because definitely there was no way that the image, the visual language stands, and the music language stands in uh, uh, as a driving force. We had to make a choice. But when uh, these young musicians came in, I understood that actually it's a music that should drive, because here is a, a very rich tradition, and uh, I can only think, of, we think about it, how to reapproach it. And uh, so I step out and I let the music take over, and then we did Ale uh, Retour. So this really is a multimedia project in the fullest sense of the word, that the, the music and the film are co-equals. Yes, they are co-equals. Yeah. So, multimedia, or also we can call it cross-disciplinary, since there is really different disciplines that co come together, and how they coexist to tell one story, where they respect each other, where one has to step out, step in, so there is all these yeah. waves that should be respected. So, so the songs that we'll hear through the production, are they authentic traditional songs or are they songs arranged by Dimitri? Basically we took authentic traditional songs uh, as a repertoire and then Dimitri re rearranged them. He rearranged them because we also wanted that they play together. 
As you may know, uh, there are five Central Asian countries, uh, ex-Soviet Central Asian countries, uh, and uh, curiously we are not so aware of each other's culture. So somehow this project also became a, a way to uh, rebuild our common ground and create the common language. And also you will see in the performance now that there are moments that Dmitri composes, it's his composition. So uh, there are also moments that it's only composition of Dmitri working. It's, it's fairly common for theater directors to make films. One thinks immediately of people like Peter Brook or Julie Taymor. Uh, but it's less common for filmmakers, film directors, to do live performance. So what kind of adaptation was required from you to work in, in live performance? Well, I think it's quite fascinating working with a live performance because you cannot control it. <laughs> you control it in a certain moment. Now I cannot control, you know, like you're going to go now to see the performance and it will happen as it goes. I cannot do anything, even if I would like to, <laughs> you know. So this, I think, is a beautiful part of live performance. What you cannot fix Okay, I can fix the image, I can edit, fix the sound, but here the life comes, you know, and it overtakes. And I think that this is the beauty of this project, that it's, it's for me, it's the first time I work with a live performance. They might feel not well, someone would like to cough, someone doesn't, you know, so many things that might happen, you know, it's just an energy that goes, that flows there. And uh, I guess the beauty of it is to rediscover it each time and... Uh, and uh, see how it goes. Uh, but going back to your uh, essential question is that um, I think that for me, in certain moment I understood that I would like to explore other tools in art uh, to express myself, uh, not only as a, a director of uh, fiction films, narrative films, but also working with the video installations, sound installations, why not sculpture, why not drawing, you know, I think that there is all this liberty as far as it serves to our expression, we can go ahead without limits. Well, the other difference between working in film and working in live performance is that at the end of the film, uh, the actors go home. They go away, they get paid, and they go on to their next project. This project, uh, Kuz, it's, it's a little bit hydra-like. It, it, it's extending all over the place, uh, and we're seeing one part of it here, which is the live performance, but there's a whole element of it that's really tied to the mission of the Aga Khan Music Initiative, which is educational at root. So for these young women who are on the stage tonight, it's, it's for them, it's a school, right? It's a laboratory. Definitely. It became a laboratory and it became also uh, an educational uh, experience in their life because uh, when they were casted, what I was looking for, of course, for a talent, but mostly for an emotion and for... Uh, so I was just... I trusted many of them. I said, okay, well, I trust this girl, it will, it will happen. And then that's the moment when I came to the Aga Khan Foundation and I said, listen, let's just get them into the education process, you know. So each of them had a, uh, a teacher that was with them throughout one and a half year. So uh, basically it was just till mid-February that they were still going to the private classes to master their music, to master their vocals. And uh, so I think that this is quite important for this project, that it's not just a project that is done with the professional musicians, with the security, but we took risk and we gave, we believed into them. We said, okay, we just walk with them throughout this uh, one and a half year, we do everything, we create them um, uh, conditions to grow in their music, and then uh, it happened. The, each time we met, it was a surprise. It's the most beautiful surprise when you see girls uh, casted when they are 17 years old and now they are 19, some of them, and you see how much they grew together with the project in their talent, in their music, but also in understanding, being conscious about this music, that they are not, uh, they don't take it for granted, you know, that they don't take this music as a uh, as a subconscious memory that they carry it. No, but I think that it's interesting that they really think about it, what can be done with this music. And I think that this is another part of the project that I really hope that for them they can take out maximum they can and uh, who knows, you know, where they go after it. Mm -hmm. the, the doors are open. You, you said the other day that it's, it's not for you, it's not 
for me, it's, it's for them, it's for yes, those... It's, it's for yeah. these seven girls that are yeah. on the stage. It's, uh, yeah, I think that from the, be from the beginning we, we said, well, uh, in certain, maybe in some moment I didn't understand it, but uh, probably like on the third rehearsal I said, of course, this is the project for these seven girls. And uh, it's very important because they are women in a society that is uh, functions to enforce them. They give, we give them um, confidence uh, that they are individuals, that they are talented, that they can go on in their life with their talent and knowledge. And I think that it is extremely important in these societies. And I believe that if there is two, three, four of them, that might be, they can be a big, big changes that can happen, that can be seated around. Was one of your ambitions in doing the project to try to actually revive the oral transmission of the epic? Because the epic has the, the last uh, traditional reciter, traditional in the sense of having received the epic through a, a lineage of oral transmission, died in 2004. So there's been a rupture in that. And now through this project, in a sense, you're trying to revive by teaching these young women the epic. Is that part of it? Of course it's a part of it and, um, well, maybe it would be a little bit ambitious from my side to say that um, uh, uh, this is the way to, of today to share the oral tradition that is lost. But uh, the way I was approaching it, I said, okay, you know, that nobody has time today to sit and listen to epic recitation throughout the night. No one has that. Neither locals in Central Asia, no one on the weddings do that anymore. But what do we do, you know, like, um, there is a, it should be shorter, so you really go deep to the meaning of the story, of what is shared, and then uh, I said, okay, I'm going to use the tools of today. Before it was the voice, it was a certain uh, rhythm also in the recitation movements and gestures, and here, of course, what do we look? It's image that moves, um, it's the sound, of course, and so this is a, an intention, this project, as you say, uh, to bring back life to this beautiful, heroic, female, epic story from Central Asia, Krukkas, to a contemporary language, and uh, let's see how it goes. We have time for maybe a, a couple of questions, uh, just a few minutes, uh, but before concluding, let me just put on my school mom hat and encourage you to read the program notes, because there's an essay, short essay, it's not going to take you very long, but it will really be helpful in helping you just understand what the story is that's being told uh, and a little bit of the background about these Central Asian Amazons, which are not just legendary or mythological characters, but very much historical. They, they, they existed. There's plenty of evidence. And it's a very exciting development uh, that's going on now in archaeology uh, <coughs> of excavating graves of, of female Scythian warriors uh, in the Central Asian steppe and doing DNA analysis and discovering that a lot of these warrior graves that were long just presumed to be male are in fact graves of women and that maybe as much as a third of, of Scythian women, nomadic women uh, of the 4th, 5th century BC, were, were they were fighters. So with that, um, does anyone have a question? Yes, please. Um, you talked about your quite uh, a big, a big focus of this project is for the women that you've involved in it. It's been a huge educational, cultural uh, process for them. What's something that you hope audiences will get out of this work? Um, who will encounter it? What What's something that audiences would get out of this work? Well, I guess there is many layers what you can get from this uh, work. Um, first of all, uh, I'm not sure if uh, anyone here traveled to Central Asia and, uh, and what exactly the culture is there. So there is, uh, of course, you will get to know the region, not only through the images, but also through the sound of it. So it's a sound landscape of the region. And, uh, of course, there is another part of it, is, um, <clears throat> is the story of the Amazon, of female warriors. I think that it is uh, a very interesting, very uh, important also today story of female empowerment in the world. And uh, also, I should add to this, um, 
I think it's a way to get to know um, the creative potential of Central Asia today, uh, of contemporary composer, of contemporary filmmaker, of uh, costume designer, of stage designer, of uh, there is um, uh, so there is all these elements that are working together. So it's not only traditional music or creativity, but it's mixed with a contemporary input in it. So, and uh, of course, art, it speaks, I, I believe so, it speaks for, for many, many points in the society that uh, any, any culture goes through. And uh, so you can learn as culturally, as colors of the landscape, the sounds of the landscape, the sounds of the instruments, the story of the 40 girls. It's a very abstract interpretation, I should say, but it leaves a liberty. Uh, to to th think about it, so that's how I see it. Yes, please. You have talked briefly about the current role of women in Central Asia, and is there a need to enhance the opportunities for women in the area? Enhance? What does mean by that? That that role? I think it's an extremely important because, um, of course, uh, women were. You know, looking at through the layers, um, uh, for sure during Soviet times uh, there was an emancipation of women in Central Asia. It's, it definitely happened. Uh, Uzbekistan was veiled, we got unveiled. You go to Central Asia and you see women as me. You know, we are open and we go to school, we are literate. But then I, I, I look around and what I see that there is a big tendency, especially now, last 10, 10 years, that young women think that the aim of life is to get married and build a family, which of course is important and I respect everyone's choice, but then anything can happen in life, you know, so they don't look at themselves as an independent individual out of the structure of the family, and I think that this is extremely important for any society, that a woman is independent. Yes, please. Uh, I read in the background material about the buildings that you discovered yourself as you were doing your research, the historic uh, ruins. Could you tell us what kinds of buildings those were? The, 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 yeah, the question is about the, the historical uh, uh, ancient buildings that Saudat discovered. Well, I wouldn't. Uh, well, I discovered how uh, through through the work that was already done, definitely by archaeologists and historians. But it was a discovery for me. It was a personal discovery. So, uh, when I started researching on the Kirkus, basically I um, I stumbled upon uh, the information about uh, architectural buildings in the south of Uzbekistan and in the west of Uzbekistan, which is today which today lays in uh, Autonomous Republic of Karakal, Pakistan, in Uzbekistan. So uh, I, I traveled to both uh, places to, to see, and they are quite different. The one in the, in the south, it definitely comes from Islamic period. So it's a Samanid architecture, and uh, the locals say that, they were, that it was a school of young women, uh, a higher education school, and then there were invaders, and so there is another version of the story. So basically they committed suicide because they didn't want to be invaded. Uh, what, for me, what you're going to see now in the film, uh, the biggest part is filmed in Karakal, Pakistan, where uh, there is big Kirkuskala, a big 40 girls fortress, and a small Kirkuskala. Uh, they lay very close from each other, and that, they say, dates to 4th, 6th century before Christ. So again, here we come to Scythians and to the Masagets that were uh, in the region at that period and um, so basically uh, I spoke to local ar ar archaeologists and their version is that it was uh, stationary fortresses of women or where they would stand, uh, get ready for to defend themselves going to... they never invaded them, eh? they only defended them. I think that that makes a big difference. And basically I asked uh, an archaeologist, I said, but how would you know that it's a female, that it's not male, you know? Of course we can speak a lot about it, but just to make it sure, she told me a very beautiful story when they were excavating, because it gets very hot in summertime, they would do it overnight. And he said, you would take a layer of earth under the moonlight in the step, and you would see the bits of women spread throughout, uh, inside of the fortresses, you know? You take out the layer and there are bits. You take out the layer and there are bits. And he says what is interesting is that they are, they are cut. So the, he says probably that really makes you think that there was a battle. 
and uh, that there was a kind of an aggressive way of cutting off these beats. And it really got planted in my imaginary, and we're going to see the role of the beats uh, in uh, the visual uh, story. Just one last point about the filming in Karakal Pakistan. You said it's hot in the summer. I don't think people here understand what you mean. What was the actual temperatures this summer in Karakal Pakistan when you were filming? Daytime. Plus 60 Celsius. That's like 145 degrees, something like that. Uh, so, you know, Saudat has true grit as a filmmaker uh, to have, have done that filming. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're out of time, and thank you very much for coming uh, here, and we hope you enjoy the show. Uh, thank you again to uh, the Hop for organizing this. Please take advantage of the bar, both before and after the show. Not too much before, you want to be very sober, I think, to, to watch this. Um, but thank you again for coming. Thank you.